Hey everybody, and welcome back. Today is going to be part three of our general Monte Carlo series, and part two of our applying it to a real life scenario. So what we've done previously as a quick recap is we've reviewed how we're going to take our prediction models and we're going to iterate over them multiple times, changing the, the randomness variable within the predictive model to give us slightly different results each time, because uh, that randomness does play a part into how the random force operates. What well, stats it starts with, where it goes from each one, what the thresholds are, etc. It's going to change things up a little bit, which can make our predictions a little bit different, which is going to be good in the long run because it gives us a little more variability and gives us a... We're throwing out a bigger net, essentially, as far as how we look at the projections we're getting and how we're factoring that into our optimizer. So in the previous video, we took an actual player list from FanDuel from last year, 2020, and we kind of went through the process of taking our sample data and tying it to our player list and running that through our predictive models. But uh, we were do doing it in a not so efficient manner, right? Um, we were training our models every single time we ran it and taking that methodology going forward would have us retraining our models every single day of the season. And that's not efficient, that's not terribly realistic either. That's a, a terrible waste of resources and it's not ideal. So what we're gonna be doing today is learning how we can take our larger data set, we can train our models, still running through them x, y number of times, however many times you want to get a, a new iteration of the model, saving it locally, already trained and ready to go, so that when you do come upon an instance where you're ready to run some projections and get some numbers, run through an optimizer to make some plays for the day, your model's already locked and loaded. You just have to feed in your daily data and get your numbers out. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to go ahead and zoom through this. Um, this is the exact same introduction, I guess, that we went through in our last video. Um, so if none of this looks familiar to you at all, check the previous video um, and you'll see what I'm talking about. We've got our data. We've joined it to our player list. We are prepping our data with our features and our labels to run into our model. now. This is where things are going to change from our previous iteration of this. We need to import the pickle module because that's how we're going to be saving and accessing our saved models. And then we get to our big for loop. And last time we were splitting our data, training our model, getting predictions out of our model, appending that to a data frame, and doing that over and over again within this for loop. Now we're not going to be doing all of that. We are going to still we're doing 10 different lineups, 0 through 9, or 10 different models, 0 through 9. We're getting a random integer for our randomness variable. We're splitting our data, same as normal. We are defining our random forest regression algorithm. We are fitting it to our training data. But now, instead of getting predictions from our trained model, we are going to save it to a local file location. So what I've done is within the same file directory that this multi-predict3 Jupyter Notebook lives at. I've created a subfolder called models and then I'm saving this file. It's going to be model and then the integer 0 through 10 whichever one we're on. It's going to be the file name. It's going to be a .txt file. We're writing to it with the pickle module and then we're going to dump it, dump that whole trained model and everything to that location. So if we do that we can open up our file folder here and we can see model 0, 1, 2, 3. We're going to go all the way up to 9. And just to recap, I know we've used pickling before, but if we open that up, it's a whole lot of nonsense that doesn't mean much to us, right? It's a big file. You can bet that because that is our entire trained model, right? And you can see there's some words in there. It might make a little sense to you, but in general, as it is unusable, it's been pickled. We will have to unpickle it in order to use it. But we have our nine models there. So how we are going to access them and use them is the next part. To do that, we're going to need to import the OS module. Just means operating system. Nothing crazy. I am going to define a variable called models. And also the OS module comes native with Python. You don't need a pip install. You should just be able to import it. No problems. I'm going to define a models variable and I'm going to use the os.listdir command. What that means is list directory. It is going to 
look at the directory models, or in this case the subdirectory within the, the parent directory it lives in. If you want to save it outside of the folder that your Jupyter Notebook lives in, like if I wanted to save this elsewhere, you can do that. I would just have to denote the full file path here. It's going to assume that without a full file path, it is a relative file path, and it is going to go to its parent directory, which is wherever this Jupyter Notebook lives, and then it's going to start looking from there. So list directory is going to look for a directory or a folder name. So it sees the folder models. And I'm asking for a list of all the files inside, basically. If I get that, you can see model 0 through 9 dot text. Those are all the files within here. If you have multiple file types, for instance, if I had saved them just in here without being in a separate folder, if I come back here, and I do that, now I'm gonna get all of the files in the parent directory because that's where it's looking without a given file path. You could do that, then you just have to sort through this list and make sure you're only pulling in the .txt files. But that's not what we're doing, but that is something you can do. You'll just need to point it to wherever you're gonna save them. And so you can do this for any type of files you have. If you just need to do some cleanup on your, your local directories and this is an easier way to do it, you can do it that way as well. You can delete files this way, you can create files this way, you can open them to edit. There's all sorts of things you can do with Python in that sense, but for right now, we're just pulling a list of the files present in that directory. Now, how do we call them into action? Because that is really what we're getting at here. That's gonna be pretty simple. We're gonna do the same thing we've done previously. Now we're going to define our compare data frame, okay? But now we're doing for model and models, okay? So that means we're gonna loop through once for every single one of these items in this list, which happen to be the file names for our models. Now we need to define the model path. And I'm going to do os.path.join, models and model. What that's going to do is, let me show you here. That is a way, a quick, easy way to define okay so what we're going to do here is we're basically creating the file path okay the directory and the file name another way to do this would be to manually manually combine them so we could do models model Oop. we could do that and do the same thing okay this is just going to I've had issues in the past sometimes you define that wrong or sometimes in the file name it'll find an escape character and think it's supposed to break out I found it's just cleaner and easier to let the computer figure it out for you and put all of the, the directory breaks and all of that in there so you don't have to worry about it. So all we're doing here is we are creating the file path to that model. Because if we just said for model and models, open the model, it's gonna try to open model0.txt, but it's gonna try to do it from this parent directory, right? Because without the, the directory in that file path, it doesn't know it needs to go one folder deeper. So that's all we're telling it to do, is we're telling it to go into that directory, and for each of those models, we're going to work with and that's the path for it. So now that we have the path we can feed, we're gonna go ahead and open that path as my file. Then we're gonna load it using our pickle module again. We are going to then just like normal get our predictions and then we're going to drop that prediction into our compare data frame and we're gonna do model. And we're going to slice that with the fifth and sixth characters just to get this number basically here. Since it's all single digit numbers, we don't need to worry about it. And then we're gonna take a look at our data frame. So we ran through. We should have predictions, or predict underscore zero through nine, along with whatever data is already in our player list two. We can see we have last three, five, seven, see with an average, and then predict zero, one through nine. All right. So there, we were able to pull our data in, pull our model in, use it, and move on to the next one without having to train it in this step. 
and just to drive that point home for you we are going to restart this entire kernel and we are just going to run through everything and we're going to skip the step where we define the models just so you know I'm not pulling your chain so we're not going to run this one just so you can tell that there's no model saved just in the background because we just trained them we're going to do this again we're going to run it again and we look and there we go we pulled all our models in okay and these are the exact same models we had the first time because we did not retrain anything we did not feed new data into anything we pulled the exact same model out and gave it the exact same data that we had just given now there is going to be more variability doing this than as our previous models where we get a single output for each player but as you can see we have our predictions for Giannis tonight ranging anywhere from looks like 45 up to 57 so okay that's a pretty big spread but that's good to know and I know we talked about this last time how we can interpret it this if we're low on a player high on a player how we can factor all that in um, but we're just gonna go ahead and now we have the fancy points we're gonna compare those two and we're gonna look so he scored 46 points looks like if we had been on the low side of our predictions we would have been pretty dang close Luca was 69 it looks like even on our high side he would have vastly outperformed those predictions Andre Drummond at 51 looks like if we were on the high side of Drummond we would have been pretty close and don't forget again we're using the last 357 in season average which is not a very good data set I know I said it before and I will continue to say it every single time so nobody takes this and thinks that they're going to beat the world with it this is just for an example but that's all today it was a pretty short video because we did everything in the last one this is just showing you the other version of it and I didn't want a 35 to 40 minute video doing them both in one um, so moving on from here we've established our basics web scraping we've established our basic data analysis we've established our basic machine learning we've established our basic lineup optimization we've established our basic uh, Monte Carlo-esque simulating um, so what we have left to do before we really dive deep is an introduction to databases and how to manage data um, and that's going to kind of go hand in hand and step up as we get more advanced but we have a, a, some, a little bit of introductory work to expose everybody to it and then tying in with the database information is we're going to go over how to deal with um, differing player names from data source to data source and I know that's something that has been asked about a ton I've given some brief descriptions in YouTube comments and in the discord for the Patreons about how that would be done but I've yet to actually show it um, and it's not terribly complex, you just have to do it. It takes a little bit the first time, and there's a lot of clever ways, if you can think them up, to get it done. But it still requires some oversight, and it takes a little bit of time. But one of those things you only do once per player per data source, and 95% of the players match up fine. So we'll get to that soon. But until then, um, thank you to everybody in the Patreon. Uh, you will notice in this video, we got a green screen back here. You all can thank the patrons in the Patreon for that. Their continued support has allowed me to upgrade my recording setup here. Between camera, mic, a little bit better lighting, green screen. Everything that goes in the Patreon comes right back here into the channel. So, uh, thank you to all of them. And I will see you guys next time.